Methodist Health Ministries. MHM has been with us for 22 years. Nurse Family Partnership. State Representative Ina Manhattas, who provided scholarships for a number of child care providers to attend. The Children's Shelter, Texas A&M University, San Antonio, Texas, Texas Association for the Education of Young Children, San Antonio Chapel, United Way, San Antonio and Bay County, also a sponsor for 20 years. University Health System, UT Health Pediatrics, and thank you so much to all of them for making this possible. Congress of Children has always been community service. Um, the themes and topics change every year based on the most pressing issues that we in our community partners will be working on or are working on. For the past several years, the focus has been on trauma and adverse childhood experiences. This year's Congress focuses on the inequities that many of us have known all along existing, but have not been so blatant until the COVID-19 pandemic. Behind the inequities in health and income, education and others, lies the ugliness of racism. Many of us thought, and I was probably one of them, thought that our communities in our country had moved beyond that, and we were wrong. We can't support the healthy growth and development of children without addressing the trauma of racism and actively came to become anti-racist. We're so excited to have all of our presenters because of the way the technology works. I am not gonna come back and forth and introduce people because I don't wanna take time away from the presentations. So I will do that right now briefly. Um, also, I want you to know that there is a break uh, because of the technology, because people are in different places in the country to bring them in between sessions. The first session will be presented by Dave, Dr. David Willis. Uh, Dr. Willis is a pediatrician and he's senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Social Policy. And he will be talking about the very earliest relationships that determine the futures of babies and children and how those relationships can be impacted by the inequities faced by their parents and them. He will be joined with two co-presenters, Ms. Nelda Reyes and Ms. Mary Callier Wells. They are all in Oregon in the West Coast trying to stay from the tragic fires that are going on there. Uh, the next presentation is on health equity with Dr. Anu Partev. Dr. Partev is a child abuse pediatrician at Cook Children's Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, prior to her current uh, position, she founded and directed a center that provided health care for children in the foster care system. And then at Cook Children's, directed a center for child abuse prevention. That's what I said. Like, ah. She has recently been named um, the director and initiator of Cook Children's Hospital Health Equity Initiative. Following the CARTEP, we have one of our local partners, the San Antonio Public Library. Claire Larkin will talk about um, some of the books that help children see positive representations of themselves, why that's necessary, and how to combat negative stereotypes they see in books and media. Claire and her fellow children's librarians have reviewed books and they've been a wonderful partner in all of our early childhood work for several years. Finally, we have a keynote presenter at four, Professor Ibram Kennedy, who is in Boston. 
and Boston University now. And Dr. Kennedy's credits and books and his incredible efforts to come at and to develop anti-racist policies and practices uh, in communities in our country just keep growing. Uh, you will hear more about him from the person who will introduce him, and that is Dr. Gregory Hutspeth. Dr. Hutspeth has fairly recently retired as professor and chair of government at St. Phillips Colleges in San Antonio, part of the Elm Colleges District. He is also the president of the San Antonio branch of the NAACP. He's also chairman of the board of Voices for Children, and I'm grateful every day for his wisdom and guidance. The conversation with Dr. Kennedy will be facilitated by Dr. George Williams. Dr. Williams is a teacher educator, and uh, most recently, uh, has been promoted to vice president for student services at our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio. We are very grateful to all of them. Um, and I think I've fulfilled my obligation. Um, and you don't need to hear me any longer because the presenters are wonderful. So. Please enjoy your afternoon. And thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everybody. I assume you can hear me. Let's assume that's good. And I'm thrilled to be here with my two colleagues, uh, Nelda Rise and Marietta Collier Wells from the Great Northwest of Portland. We are happy to say the fires have abated um, and the smoke is finally cleared. And we're having our rains, which really have been such a relief for all of us. So I'm, we're really thrilled today to be able to share with you about the journey we've been having in terms of advancing early relational health. And um, we are interested in discussing with you not only the framing about how does one support the strength and the importance of early relational health, but bring to you our thoughts and our conversations about equity and family voice in the lead of that good work. So again, I introduce my other two colleagues. Um, Marietta Collier-Wells is Parenting Program Lead Educator and Facilitator at Self-Enhancement in Portland. She is an experienced and skilled educator providing information and support to families within the African-American community and beyond. Her training and education in the field includes child development, early education methods with minor in black studies and history. And I'm also joined here by Nelda Reyes, who is principal at AB Cultural Drivers, a bicultural, bilingual consultant and cultural advocate. For the last 20 years, she specialized in equity-driven community engagement, research and evaluation studies in education, health and environment, arts and culture, space design and buildings about helping to build a more equitable social environment for all. So let me start with what our agenda will be today, which will be reviewing what we're talking about when we talk about strengthening early relational health. Then we'll talk about a, a pilot project we have about bringing and engaging family voice into creating ways in which the health system, pediatricians, and communities can partner in families in strengthening and um, the, the um, early relational environments. Then we'll have a dialogue together about what we're discovering about the parent voice and parent experience in our all efforts to advance early relational health, then we'll have a Q&A. I'm a pediatrician by training, strongly interested in, in trained in developmental pediatrics, but trained in infant mental health and early childhood, focused intently on the importance of building the future well-being. Um, the, um, what really matters for all of us is the incredible knowledge from the science that a baby's future starts incredibly early, certainly prenatally, with the environment and the experience that a mother and a father create for the safety of the pregnancy. And then in those first months and then years, 
that in the relationship experience that gets generated, a baby's future health development and early learning are built solely by the relational experiences. And they all start early and are meaningful and important. So we talked in child development about the key that early relationships are built, uh, build brain structure. Children are developed in the environment of relationships. Genes and environments interact to shape the architecture of the brain. Cognitive, emotional, and social capacities are inextricably intertwined. And we know that stress, toxic stress, and adverse experiences can derail healthy development. But the critical issue is that relationships of support surrounding early development can mitigate vulnerabilities and build future well-being. Unfortunately, we know that our children have been, are struggling. And I know all of you are keenly aware that the challenges of young children begin really early. We know that um, um, it's almost 60% of children have one risk factor for poor development. We know that almost half of young families that live in poverty, and poverty unfortunately creates stress and disruptors to healthy development. And for some children, even at the age of two, we've already seen, unfortunately, them falling off the curve of development and abilities moving forward. And my own particular area of interest is how do you create preventative mental health strategies when we know almost a fifth of children can end up later with develop diagnosed mental health disturbances that often show up in failures first of kindergarten and readiness. Um, that is the call out to action for all of us. Yet COVID just hit. And we know how the stress of all of this for families is dramatic. We're seeing that families are describing in an uh, ever-present survey that's been going on in Oregon across um, early childhood families and serving on a weekly basis as to their experiences, much of which you can see on their website as they've been tracking the communication from surveys of families, young families of what they're experiencing we know that families are stressed and they're seeing it in the um, emotional and social well-being of their young children. We know that the adults are saying that they're experiencing stress themselves and that is really important for them in terms of what the parents are experiencing. And we know that there's been dramatic shift for so many families about their economic supports. And we know that thereby that creates just the stress of the economics around them. But that's, not, but that's where we're at. And we have to be thinking about the future at the same time. One might say that no good crisis can go to waste and we have to be thinking about the rebuilding strategies. How do we move forward ever further from what we know in our fields and really imagine and rebuild and redesign and move forward towards our effort moving forward? Not the least of which is attending to the thoughts about the incredible vulnerabilities that child poverty brings. And I'm really here to tell you that it is um, um, increasingly being discussed about how, what do we do presently with national and local policies to address straight on the economic needs of young families. There are people talking about universal basic income or, or child allowance. There are actually bills in, national, in Congress that are thinking about the criticalness of advancing this vulnerable moment by bringing forward um, economic supports um, and we know that economic supports dramatically decrease the stress in families and that benefits their young children moving forward. We also know that we cannot move forward without addressing from the triple crisis that's been identified the racial justice issues of building um, equity by attending to the impacts of racism on future well-being. And we know that all the disparities that we've been worried about in early childhood not only the educational disparities, but the maternal mortality issues, maternal morbidity issues perinatally, as well as infant mortality issues are directly related to racist policies. That knowledge tells us that building future in terms of future well-being of our future population means we have to attend to the um, um, countering and disrupting and mitigating uh, racist policies that have heretofore been known to be disruptive to future well-being. We also know that we're, we, we've had a long study of the impact of the adverse childhood experiences, what have been called ACEs, but there's increasing attention now 
to the protective forces of positive experiences around risks of adversity. And there's been recent demonstrations in same ways that was what first articulated out of the um, ACE studies by Vince Felitti at the CDC, recent dialogues about and demonstrations that actually simultaneously the positive childhood experiences that adults can talk about that were a part of their childhood experience, despite their adversities, actually mitigated their future health and development. This little graphic demonstrates that as the number of no, demonstrated and experienced ch positive childhood experiences um, of adults decrease their risk from ACEs to their risk for future depression. In other words, pos positive relational experiences early also mitigate and protect against known adversities. The science is clear that relationships matter. Every major scientific contribution in the last five years calls out the criticalness of the environment of relationships and development, the importance of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments, the importance to build healthy families, and supports um, in, in an international sense of building the future well-being of um, internationally, as well as at here and the National Academy of Sciences, the criticalness of supporting young families in terms of building future well-being to our work. This is the space that we've also now called out the criticalness of focusing on early relational health. We're talking about how early relational health describes positive nurturing relationships that advance physical health, development, social well-being, and resiliency. And it builds that this is the early childhood component from what we know of healthy outcomes of positive experiences. And we're targeting the positive experiences in the earliest relational foundational moments to build the future well-beings. That's the early relational health space. It is not a new field. It is not calling something new. It is, in fact, building on all we've learned from the field of infant mental health, child development, child psychology, public health, and channeling and galvanizing the energy to bring that into a universal promotion and prevention strategy within health systems, public health, and within communities. That's the space that we've been galvanizing. I wonder if we could show this first video of what are we talking about here when we talk about relational health? What does it look like? Can you run that? Uh-oh. <laughs> you can stop it. What you're witnessing is the beauty of the relational experience. You're witnessing that both members of this loving relationship are responding, engaging, connected, emotionally connected, and you, one can observe the eye contact, the positive effect of affect, the turn taking, the moment that's in front of us. Let's go to the next um, video and see if we can show, whoops, show the, show the, whoops, the next one. That's what I said. And then it was like, ah, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? Don't do it here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and you can it's stop. just another afternoon on the you sofa stop. with dad and his son watching TV. You can Come stop. On. Okay, that's been stopped. And what you just witnessed, I'm sure many of you have seen that video before, which went viral about a year ago, the beautiful dance between the father and his wonderful nonverbal toddler. And you could actually see the dance of their relational health and we can actually describe the characteristics that were present. And if you're looking at the next slide that shows the early relational health development, these patterns, what we observe is describable. One sees the mutual attention, the engagement, the responsiveness, the enjoyment. These are skills in the interactive space. One sees a pacing of turn-taking, the initiation between a child to a caregiver and a caregiver back to the child. One can see imitation between a caregiver, a child, and a child imitating a parent. 
these are the relational health development patterns, elements that really describe the relational space in the relational health area. And under all of the relational health knowledge is the science behind it, the neurodevelopmental science that tells us that the every system of the young baby's brain and body are absorbing the experiences into developing their brain body capacities for the fundamentals of stress regulation, emotional regulation, cognitive engagement, executive system, empathy, compassion, um, sharing and playing with others, engaging in learning and becoming welcomed citizens. The skills are built into the body. They're observable at every level of the physiology from what's observable behaviorally to what is seen as the synchrony like we witnessed in those two videos to if one was monitoring heart rate, one would see that the heart rates of the caregiver and the child, when these two people are connected, emotionally connected, their heart rate patterns become connected because their autonomic nervous systems are connected around stress regulation and the development of those capacities. But that also happens with the endocrine system. And it also happens if one were monitoring EEG patterns, um, one would see the synchrony. Hence, the development happens in that relational context in the very fundamental ways to build future health development and future well-being. So we're advised advancing a mindset the importance of foundational and ongoing relationship. It arises from listening deeply with families and communities. It arises from the positive relationships environments that promote well-being. This relational health space is deeply grounded in human dignity. We oppose deeply systemic racism. We value the cultural patterns and historical experiences of community resiliency. It's, it's science-based, strength-based, and family-centric. We're not talking about a program. We're talking about an all-in approach, a shift of the mindset into a relational sense, and what you all, in one, once one crosses that chasm to have a relational frame, you then see new ways of messaging that relationships matter in all things we do, all policies we champion, all decisions we make at policy tables, all ways in which we partner in our programs, in our communities, and in our families. We at CSSP have been ad advancing this early relational health framing across systems and the child health sector. We actually, a year ago, ran a survey um, that maybe some of you participated in as to what, what um, first of all, what's the understanding of a relational health frame, which was amazingly positive. All people seem to understand that sense. Then we asked what kind of models and activities are already going on and out in the communities, not the least of which is home visiting, but there's a lot of effort toward parent education efforts, be that circle of security or incredible years or the strengthening families network or um, the focuses of room. And there are specified programs. There's good work going on in the ECE systems, childcare efforts around training, touch points on the pyramid plus approaches and also within the medical home, which is a universal platform that includes efforts like Reach on a Read, Promoting First Relationships, Adults and the like. We also explored how do we talk about this early relational health frame? And the one thing that came clear as we did the research about communication framing to talk with the, 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 the public, it became important that when we talk about early childhood in a relational health sense, we've got to make certain we're talking about the birth to three space because the public hears early childhood and hears um, preschool age and above. They don't tend to think about infants and infant toddler relationship patterns. It also became clear when we talk about early relational health that we have to be talking about also the criticalness of the caregiver, the adults, and that there are benefits for both children as well as for adults when we focus relationally. Because the thrill and the delight in the relational experience is both for caregiver as it is for the child. And there's some scientific evidence 
that says, when one supports strong relationship building, it has benefits for the caregivers to decrease their stress and to decrease and mitigate some of their vulnerabilities when people around them support the beauty of the strength of the relational moment itself. We also found from our survey work and from our um, framing study at Frameworks Institute that people value those joyful in the moment experiences. And I would propose to you that when we talk about early relational health in this moment of COVID, those in the moment, moment by moment opportunities for strong relational connection have power in terms of mitigating the stress of this moment of stress in time of COVID and thereby those moments of reading together, eating together, taking a walk together, sharing moments has a way to mitigate stress and efforts. We're moving as much as we can to advance early relational health efforts through the health system recognizing the health system touches all families and thereby an opportunity to move this work forward. We're working intentionally in Reach Out and Read and that you will not hear the sound, but one can witness the relational health as that is visible between these two. You can see a dance of, even in a book sharing moment, this little relationship is enjoying each other and sharing that moment, as can be observed in other situations where, as one witnesses in the moment in a medical office of the opportunity for book sharing, sometimes the connection is not as strong as one would wish. And thereby, we might want to think about what can be done to promote a relational health frame. We have some good beginning work going on in Michigan it's actually bringing the video feedback into the medical home with families to promote the opportunity to talk about promoting relational health. And we've also got some research work going on with some colleagues in Columbia that's looking at emotional connection through the WEX. I know in Texas, there's some interest in this space about how do we strengthen emotional connection with families again to promote the relational health space, which is so essential. So we are bringing to you the opportunity to think about how do we focus on babies and the relational context that babies have? How do we focus locally so that all of us are in the support of young families and their babies and their relational processes and the supports that we can move forward? And it becomes even more important as we think about the power of these human connections not only what we've been talking about here about early relational health, but also how do all human relationships have power? How do we harness those in terms of the support of the next generation? Here, um, our colleagues at the Fred Rogers Institute put forth these sort of three powerful messages that I'll leave you with as we shape into our next part of our conversation. Um, even one human relationship can help any one of us weather adversity and especially protect our youngest from harm. Simultaneously, the power of human relationships comes from simple, ordinary, day-by-day -day interactions. And none of us need to be perfect in that, but rather the opportunity to be able to bring forward the relational health space. Um, because we're trying to move, move forward in terms of advancing early relational health with families within the health system. What we've learned is critical to engage families in terms of what would this mean to them. We have no interest in finding a way to be judgmental of family strengths and experiences and their interactive experience. We have no desire to um, create ways in which families can feel vulnerable or more threatened. We have a very strong strength-based view and we came face to face with the recognition that, that, that equity and the voice of families joining with us in building the supports of every parent's desire for the future positive well-being of their children matters to them, as does the public's awareness that early experiences really matter. And thereby, we 
intentionally decided we wanted to learn all we could from families, families' experiences and their thoughts about um, how a health system who's eager to partner in strengthening the future resiliency for all children and families, not the least of whom are those families of stress and challenges, what could we learn about how to bring um, um, equity into the story and the processes and the um, opportunities that as the child health system is transforming, how can we become more partnered in that kind of effort? That generated this work that I'm gonna ask my colleague Nelda um, to begin to talk to us about. Nelda? Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And it's a pleasure and an honor just really to represent some of what we've heard in communities uh, about what early relationships um, mean for them. Uh, as David was saying, uh, we started to do some work in collaborating with uh, Portland State University and uh, CSSP and ourselves as community um, researchers uh, to actually get into an exploratory study and uh, we wanted you know it's 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 the core of of the work uh, to be a participatory approach uh, that it was uh, deemed to be culturally specific and asset based and strengths based and putting like david said um you know the dignity and the voices of the families up front um we were able to uh, do a very initial and i say soft touch ex a participatory approach because uh these are questions that we already had set as you know it's a very very initial touch base on what is what 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 do you know early relationships look like in these communities particularly uh, at the rural in rural Oregon with the African American communities and the Latinx community. Um, and so we used a participatory approach basically, uh, you know, getting the support and partnership of parents within these three communities. And um, as, as, and, and we, we, we call them our consultants, right? So they, we were meeting monthly uh, and they supported you know, and kind of co-led um, the uh, conversations that uh, that happen with larger communities um, or larger larger groups of members in their community to um, to learn about what uh, these relationships meant. Um, we uh, work together all together uh, uh, with the, the the consultants to. Uh, facilitate this monthly conversations and they supported us in all the uh, research design and identifying the me measures for the research and what the data collections uh, uh, methodologies were and the interpretation and the findings. Um, so one of the important, uh, I think, pieces of this is that this was uh, as a, any participatory approach, a place where we came to make together, right? So there's the leadership partners, there's um, there's uh, you know the partners in the community, there's our parents that were acting as consultants in those monthly meetings and advising and co-creating with us, and there's us as facilitators, and we had a research assistant in each group. And we consider you and other professionals as part of this community and these stakeholders. So in a way, we are all acting together in order to understand what this other relationships mean to people. Um, okay, I think we can go to the next one. So I'm gonna, you know, specifically talk, this is, you can see in the picture of where uh, consultant advisory group. Uh, these are uh, the mothers in the communities from different places. Um, 
located in uh, rural Oregon and suburban Oregon, uh, and all from Latinx, uh, you know, Spanish-speaking mothers, um, and sharing their experiences. Um, I'm gonna, you know, touch on there's there's a lot that came up from the findings, but I'm gonna touch on some of the things that are very connected to, you know, some the 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 aspects or the the pieces that 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 are um, part of early relationships, you know, like attention and engagement and mutual enjoyment, um, you know, initiation and things that, you know, scientifically had happened. So I would say that overall in this group, we did see the connection between what the science is saying and what families are saying. And you can see this in some of these findings. Can you go to the next, David? Do you have it now? Mm -hmm. No, I'm still seeing the pictures. Interesting. Maybe it's a little delay. Hmm. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. I don't know quite why it's not sharing. I'm going to reshare. So I'm going okay. to stop sharing, and then I'm going to reshare. How about now? You have it? There we are. Yeah, Good. perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just highlighting here, you know, what parents interpret as a close, safe relationships. Now, again, this is, you know, remember that when we ask these questions uh, with, you know, larger groups of the community, we this was exploratory. So we didn't have anything to put as a baseline, right? This is what they um, referred to directly. And uh, there was nothing that we had fed into the conversation. Uh, so again, pretty, you know, basic um, findings at this point. Um, so what parents interpret as close and safe relationships between the parent and a baby. Um, and so you can see here, I mean, this is, are the, the, the simple interactions that happens that have to do uh, with early attachment practices that have to do with attention, with, you know, uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the children, you know, what are the, the, some of the important and positive parenting practices, simple as showing love, affection, caring, uh, allowing them to explore and tending to the baby's physical and emotional needs. And then we did get uh, a lot of, you know, in, interesting insights specifically about nutrition, health, and education, which is what Latin, uh, Latinx moms were focusing on. Um, they talked about also uh, about supporting their children's growth and development through daily routines, uh, supporting their physical development and exercise. So there is you know, a lot of kinesthetics and games and songs that had to do with, you know, physical interaction as well as uh, language development. And Latinx moms really talked about nutrition and exposing them to a, a wide variety of foods and flavors, um, and then being very verbal uh, with the, the babies. Next one. Did it shift? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we talked about, you know, what, what, are, what is their experience with early parenting challenges? And this was very consistent. I mean, this these are challenges that you probably hear about all the time. Um, there was a, a lot of consciousness about how these challenges actually change or impacted the family dynamics. And this was a big concern of the Latinx moms, um, as well as uh, you know, several cases of premature birth and 
Um, the issues that came with that in terms of the family dynamics and the having to visit the hospitals or stay in the hospitals for longer times, um, which was usually not anticipated um, or they didn't know what to expect. And so there's um, a lot of dissonance between what they were expecting to happen with you know, their birth and their baby um, and their reality um, and the stress that that put into the family. Um, you know, the perceived role that they see from, you know, medical providers, as some of you are, in supportive early relationships. I mean, the basic, you know, obviously physical health, uh, but they do see, um, you know, health providers as, as um, ones that they will seek for support beyond physical concerns. Um, and we explore behavioral you know, concerns that they have or any special needs um, that they could, um, you know, learn from or, you know, navigate the process to get support for any special uh, related needs. And then um, that they would expect, right, when anything is identified, then timely and accurate referrals. Um, there was a lot of experience um, a few negative experiences shared about how not having timely referrals had had a huge impact in, again, their families and the, the child. And so parents are, um, can you go to the next one, David? Mm-hmm. Okay. Hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so then, uh, you know, what? what is the role of, um, of the medical provider, right? What are some things and opportunities that are uh, at place? I'm not seeing it, David, but maybe it's delayed. It seems to be a bit delayed, Hilda. I think so. Okay, so I have it now, thank you. So the, you know, uh, of course, the, I'm setting this up as, a, you know, there was a lot of experiences shared. There's a lot of, you know, some positive and some negative. Uh, but these are, you know, the, the basic things that I think if um, we have some good takeaways, this, this would be something that will be helpful for the Latinx community. Um, Investing time in building close relationships with the family unit. I think this is quite important. Not only thinking about the child that you're seeing, but then the interaction between the child and the family system and how Latinx family, you know, see us as part of the whole. So if you're seeing one child, then understanding what that dynamic is, because that's, that's the way that they express the, their concerns. Um, usually uh, will come from, you know, talking about one child, but then expressing concerns related to the other ones or comparisons or things like that. So it's very important to, to see that that family unit and relationships uh, with that family unit are, are very important for them. Uh, so active, active and unbiased listening. We heard a lot of experience of dismissiveness, of downplaying concerns. Uh, of negligence as well. And that had led to distrust and, and frustration. Um, uh, you know, pay special attention when parents' observations point out to concerns that are described out of the norm. Um, overall, these parents uh, seem to be very engaged and uh, um, connected or the way they describe their interactions was very connected, you know, in, in the way that they would say, you know, in terms of the attention and engagement and um, initiation. And it seems that they have a good grasp of what could be the out of the normal. And so they really want to be able to have those conversations with you. Increased training to become uh, more effective in identifying special needs. This was a very strong one. I cannot highlight it enough. Uh, they are directly asking for doctors to be, you know, 
better prepared to identifying these needs and provide the timely referrals and being able to provide that primary care to special needs uh, child while also understanding you know what that special need entails and working with their system of support means school or you know other specialists and you know psychiatrists or whatever is their support uh, network to be able to serve them better so they do see the interconnection in their uh, support system. And so that's important also for them, for you to recognize. And increase the cultural and language competency. I mean, they're speaking about ideally having a, a Spanish language and a highly you know, cultural fluent uh, provider uh, if possible. Uh, and, and that there is, um, a possibility, you know, to expand uh, that um, the, the communication that exists be between the system in the healthcare, the, the healthcare system, so they can be referred to professionals that actually speak their language. And so I, I find this particularly important for the Pacific Northwest and maybe other areas of the country. Uh, but in terms of the context, you know, it's, it's not that you know, the, there's a lot of uh, doctors out there from their perspective that can tend to their needs uh, and have the skills to do it in terms of language and cultural fluency. That's spectacular, Nelda. I think I'm going to switch us now so that Marietta has a chance to share also with us and we can continue the conversation as we move mm -hmm. forward. So, Marietta, can I turn to you? Hi. You sure can. Great. So share with us some of your thoughts about the, how the family groups you worked with, about the value of found, these foundational relationships, and what some of the experiences you heard, and what were some of your thoughts? Uh, first of all, hello. Good morning to everyone. Um, the experiences were amazing. They were absolutely amazing. Um, the parents that were chosen, they were excited to be part of the focus group and they were excited to meet other parents and to share their experiences. Um, the main thing that I heard uh, as listening to each and every one of the families is that um, some of their concerns and their experiences is um, they're concerned that there was a relationship to be established between them and a provider and how they were going to be perceived, if they were going to be believed, uh, because they felt that this was just as important as getting the actual medical service. Um, and within that, that's what they call the, a relation. And in the relationship, there would be some trust established. And from that trust, they felt that the healing process would be um, what occur, even the better. But it's uh, very difficult when the parent feels that the doctor or the essential worker is having a difficult time under not understanding them, but hearing them, hearing their needs. And so um, from these different groups, you were able to hear the hearts of each and every one of these parents through their experiences. Some of the experiences that was shared were, were tear jerkers because they, they, weren't, um, they weren't fake, they were real. And in the environment that we had in the focus group, they were comfortable enough and, and, and that realness and that authenticity was, was easy to come out. So all you could do is really is listen and hear their hearts. Um, the main thing that I got out of the, the group is hearing that it's important for the parent to be heard. Uh, that parent voice, it must be heard uh, because they feel that they're representing their child and representing their child as uh, as we saw in the viewings, that interaction that is established. Well, this is established before they even come into that office and they want that to continue on even in the relationship when they get to the office. 
And also, um, they discussed about when they came into the office, who ushers them in, that person that they meet and greet at the desk. That is important for the relationship to be with that person also. And a lot of times uh, from listening to the conversations, there wasn't a pushback uh, somewhat with the actual physician themselves. It might have been with the greeter, um, as we call it, is a usher in, uh, in the office. And so they were concerned with that because sometime there, there was a nonverbal uh, discord that was in the office when they walked in and it made them very, very uncomfortable and also became even a more protector of their child, even though they still had to go to that office because that was the assigned office to them. And then also they spoke about the type of insurance that you had uh, also catered to the type of care that you received. So if you were getting uh, if you were getting benefits and health coverage from your job or if you were getting benefits and health coverage from the state, they felt there was a huge difference. There was a huge void in between the care that was provided. So pretty much um, it, it's about the relationship. It's about it being established, sustained. Uh, it's about trust. It's about having a voice and being heard and and realize that in those relationships, when I come to you as parent with my child, that you're going to hear me because for you to hear me, my child will be serviced properly. Marietta, that's absolutely spectacular too. One of the first important questions in the question box was, how does what we learned from parents about um, working in a health system how might it apply to the other systems and communities, other programs that also touch young families? And what do you think from what you learned from the focus groups talking about health system, trust and partnership with families applies to other programs like home visiting or childcare or early Head Start or Head Start or preschool? What do you think similar, what do you think might be different that we're learning about strengthening families and supporting relationships? Any thoughts? Well, um, one thing we have learned is that it's going to take all of us. It's not an isolated situation. It's across all cultures. It's a call across all economic backgrounds. It's across all languages. Um, it, it, we're, we're all on this ride. And you must understand it's going to be a bumpy ride. It's going to be a bumpy ride, but it's necessary for it to happen because a lot of these policies and changes and postures, they don't exist. Or if they did, they've been put on the side because we're chasing after things that is not necessary. So what happens is these things have to be put back on the table. Understand that it's going to take a minute because you know the rule of thumb is whatever has been learned can be unlearned by looking at alternatives. And it's for us to know that we have to do this together. It is important. You might be in a situation where you're the only one, you're the only beautiful one in your culture that is sitting there and that's okay. So expect that and that is important. Um, yeah, we, we gotta do this together. We can't do it apart. And we can't do it apart from the parent, the parent voice. You have to hear before you start creating tools and systems. And before you start, yay, I'm, I'm here to help. You can't help unless you listen. So it, it, it's a really simple equation, but we have to want to actually do it and then follow through with it and then get back with each other and say, what do you think? How did that go? And things like that. And so that those are some of my thoughts and some of their thoughts, especially. So well stated. We're learning that people in some who are innovators and thinking about reimagining the future in child health are starting with conversations with families about the relationships that matter to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beginning, rather than thinking about telling or thinking about teaching. Yes. Rather thinking about dialogue first. About yes. Uh, you and your family and your experiences and your dreams for your child 
for the future to open first level conversations. Now, then, what are your thoughts about how all of what you were learning applies to the supports around the youngest of families by other programs and efforts in the community? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I want to, you know, everything that Maria to say, plus the need to be humble. Mm -hmm. The need to be humble, I cannot say it enough. Yes, we are professionals. Yes, you know, you might be highly skilled. Yes, you do hold a lot of power. And recognize that because in your power, you know, because you have that much power, that much intelligence, that much education, you have so much privilege. And is let's own that. And with that, be an agent of change for your specific family, your specific, you know, parent and child that come to your office. Let's, you know, use that power and be humble in a way to use that power and say, I'm here to listen to you, to your concerns, to your questions, to support you and your family, as we said, as a unit to feel healthy, right? Because when one child is unhealthy, then the family is unsettled. And so knowing that construct and the power that you have and the coming with that power with humility and say, I'm trying to serve you this way. I'm trying to listening, listen to you, to your needs. Am I, am I hitting the point? Am I, am I serving the, you the right way? You know, I think it's a moment for healthcare providers to ask this question. Be humble and say, am I doing a right, the right job for you beyond, you know, beyond, you know, you know, giving the right medicine or, you know, the right diagnosis. That's super important. I think we are working, and I say we because there's a lot of people like us, you know, working with communities, trying to understand how we can all together, you know, advance towards more like, equitable and healthy society and that means education and that means you know culture and entertainment and media and it's all interconnected you know it's a thrilling response one of we have about eight nine more minutes or so and so we welcome comments or questions in the chat and we'll try to attend to them one question that comes up which is really critical to thinking ge about generational change and thinking about generational healing and thinking about the future well-being of all of our um, citizens uh, independent of their culture, background, or history. But more importantly, how, what are your thoughts about how providers or um, um, all providers think about asking the question with families about historical or past experiences? and recognizing that history, recognizing that um, you know, the, the, the trauma of past history does get passed generationally. And how do we think about having those conversations for healing and, um, and, 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 and really making a difference towards the next generational change? What are your thoughts about that? Marietta, you wanna start first? Um. I think it's important for us to, to remember that even though we all have, I call them many different roles, some of you, some of all of us have enough uh, titles that's attached to our name to almost, I mean, quite a few. But first and foremost, we're just, we're humans, we're people. And we have to make sure that we understand that um, as people, we, we bring who we are to the table. We bring uh, that to our roles. It, it is important for us to, uh, in, in these relationships, to have an open heart, mind, because where we're, the path we're about to go on, um, because of the things that have happened in life historically, some of those things have waxed our hearing our hearts are a little bit hardened. And in the medical field or any type of relationship, it is very hard to hear someone if 
what is presented first is your experiences. And I, I, I cannot say, Marietta cannot say, oh, just forget about it. What I'm asking is that, is it possible for us to just put it to the side for the moment? Because we're gonna take that, that coat of many colors with us, many places that we go. And it's for us to ask ourselves, what is the priority? What is more important? Is that in front of me or is my experience and how it made me feel, is that more important? You? important to me and I from listening to the parents a lot of times what we have to do all the time is to put those experiences to the side we're not gonna forget we're not gonna forget we're not gonna forget but the thing is that use that as a fortification to empower us so that we can represent not only ourselves but our families uh, in a certain way and what we do how we do that is through communication. And what happens is a lot of times is that when our hearts are not open to something different, to the change, then it makes it difficult for it. Thank you. And now the thoughts you have about addressing yeah. historical historical trauma. First, the mo and most important is to recognize that this has happened and continues to happen. Uh, you know, you, David, said something about, you know, the, the, the health care reaches all. That's not true, right? There's many communities in, in, in our country that are not being served at the, by, by the health system. There's there a lot of people that is out of services. And this has been widely apparent with the, you know, recent COVID-19 pandemic. And so we need to take responsibility and really know that we are failing and that's okay. And we're failing to certain communities that we have historically failed. And in this situation, you know, the, the simple fact that these communities don't have access is re-traumatizing. And so we have, you know, I'm gonna to speak to myself and, and community we have been re-traumatized by the current COVID-19 pandemic. The simple fact that we don't have, you know, equitable access is a re-traumatizing effect, has a re-traumatizing effect. So this is not part of the past, this is part of the present, and we need to recognize that, and this is the context that we are acting into. So we need to recognize this in the bigger systemic, aspect and how you are part of this system you know in this context but turn it again in the positive what we can do what you can do in your office when somebody comes to your office you can learn from them you can recognize that this has been historically happened that is happening right now and say you know having conversation what has their experience been in the health system you might have somebody that has never had come to the health system we're talking about vaccination now, yeah. right? For COVID, people maybe have not been vaccinated before. And so learn about, the, I would say, learn about their stories, learn about their experience, get in touch with that and make sure that you know enough so you are not re-traumatizing your clients. And by this, mm -hmm. I mean emotionally, by this, I mean socially, economically, learn about their financials. Um, and and I don't know, this is maybe too much to ask because I know you do a lot already, but mm -hmm. engage, get engaged in your community, go out, learn about their art, their culture, you know, be the community doctor, the family doctor, you know, if you can advocate in your professional platforms for accessibility, if you, you know, you can volunteer, and, and, and do certain activities that could expand services to those that don't, don't have access to the health system. That, that would be wonderful. <laughs> but again, going back to what's possible in the time that you have with families and you know, listen to their stories and, and with the recognition that it's very likely they have had some kind of trauma with, by interacting with the system. Listening is really important, and I'm so glad, Nelda, you reminded me about 
there's so many also families that don't have access to child health. Mm -hmm. And that's an important reminder, but it, you and I just made visible too that I can bear hearing what I can't see. Yeah. And on my own anti-racist journey and my experience of being white privileged, you know, I don't, ha I have blind spots and my blind spots can be in mm -hmm. language, they can be in awareness, they can be in um, attitudes that I need to understand. And I'm strong enough to hear it. And it's in those authentic conversations that actual change, uh, the sense of trust grows. And okay. today, what I know our time is coming to a close, um, we are, we're very hopeful to be able to share with the audience, um, not only what uh, the science and the fields of child health and community systems are um, recognizing as the criticalness of what the future brings. Like uh, Marietta said, we've got to imagine a future where we have trusted relationships, where we can have authentic conversations, where we can discover together new ways of operating, and we can listen from the heart, and we can listen to the power that relationships build at every level, not only for the next generation of children, but also between us in our communities, between us in our in our efforts to really respect deeply the all of our commitments to to share together the new journey of imagining a future that's better for all people and for all families and children. We wanted to share with you what our journey has been uh, with listening to families deeply and bringing this story, these messages, these communication strategies and this effort forward into the work that we're gonna to continue to move forward and a champion. So um, I wanna thank uh, Nelda Reyes, I wanna thank Marietta um, for joining us today. And I think I can turn it back to you or to the next presenter. Thanks all. Voices for Children's mission expands our community's capacity to respond to current and emerging needs of children through purposeful and strategic advocacy that improves programs, practices, 